Okay, so we're going to start in chapter 21 of the Tyndall and She book, and if you're not using Tyndall and She, then just be looking for a chapter in the text that refers to the Progressive Era. Uh, as you can see by the dates posted here, there's a little bit of overlap between that and the Gilded Age, and that's because a lot of the material that we're going to speak about is uh, Gilded Age uh, influenced in terms of uh, former things that have come through. So we're going to be looking at... Um, how the progressive era went forward. Um, so um, when we look at the Gilded Age, the various sources that plow into it in terms of intellectual and, and um, philosophical uh, tend to come from the Gilded Age period. And, you know, one of the best um, definitions that I've read for progressivism is uh, one that comes from a, a textbook from uh, David Kennedy, um, and w in which he said that progressivism is a political response to the rapid industrialization of the late 19th century and its negative social byproducts. And I think that that's really um, a, a very nice, succinct uh, explanation for uh, how that happens. And, and so we always want to remember it broken down into its parts. So the progressivism is, is really, a, it's a political response. It's the belief that the federal government, particularly, but government uh, genetically, generically, excuse me, that is going to um, make up for the, let's call them the bad things about capitalism, if it, as it were. And so, um, so the social unrest of the end of the 19th century bled over into the 20th. So business owners who were more interested in securing changes to avoid the problems uh, that they experienced beforehand, uh, known as the progressive era, right? It was mo marked by a growth in the middle and upper classes. And, um, and it, it uh, is, again, kind of a response to what happened in the Gilded Age and, and sort of the, the uh, things that were seen as not happening. Uh, in the in the Gilded Age, so one of the first things to have influence here is something called the social gospel, and the social gospel movement is in some ways a response to Andrew Carnegie's uh, gospel of wealth. And if you recall from the last unit, gospel of wealth is uh, the notion that um, you know people who work hard and play by the rules and are devoted and dedicated to their work. And our good people, meaning God-fearing, you know, hardworking individuals, are blessed by God uh, and tend to become wealthy. This is um, nothing new in American history, and certainly we still see it today uh, in, in the 21st century, uh, something called the prosperity gospel, uh, which comes out of the 1960s and 70s, where it's, you know, essentially God wants you to be well off. God wants you to be wealthy. And so... Um, uh, but you know, um, Carnegie had start a uh, had started a, a a movement to give wealth away, and he gives a significant chunk of his money away before he he dies, and uh, because he believed in the obligations of the noble class, something in Europe referred to as noblesse oblige, and uh, preached in the gospel of wealth that it was then the responsibility of the well-off to ensure that society was benefiting from their wealth and that they should do great things for society. And Carnegie gave away money for hospitals and libraries and universities, of course, Carnegie Mellon University and Carnegie Institute and Carnegie Hall, you know, all these different things that uh, bear his name. And this was followed by Rockefeller and uh, Morgan and all the other types of wealthy people. And again, we see that uh, today with uh, people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and others, get, you know, tripping over each other to see who can come up with the best ways to spend their money to, for the good of mankind. But social gospel was the belief that um, people aren't poor because they're bad people or they're sinners or they are lazy but rather there are conditions of their poverty and that as a Christian, as a person of God and a follower of Jesus Christ, one had an obligation to address social injustices and to help the poor. Uh, in other words, to, to give of yourself in order to ease their suffering. And this uh, movement uh, has a lot of second great awakening roots to it 
uh, where the Second Great Awakening had the sort of I am my brother's keeper kind of uh, undertones to it, Social Gospel follows along in that, that very same vein. And out of it came something called the Settlement House Movement. And uh, this included people, if you're reading from your text, this is Jane Addams and others who uh, set up uh, settlement houses, mostly in poor and immigrant neighborhoods, in order to help remove what they believed were conditions of poverty or, or what Teddy Roosevelt would call artificial obstacles to progress. And so um, these settlement house workers were mostly middle class, uh, educated women who because of their status in society were not able to utilize their intellect and, and, and other careers, went out and became the front runners to what we talk, today call social work or social workers, which is still dominated by females, uh, actually in, in a demographic sense. But um, these women went out into the slums, into the uh, ethnic enclaves, and gathered raw data about birth rates and uh, infant mortality and uh, construction problems and diet and health care and all these other issues and just collected this material for um, local and state governments in order to demonstrate the, the great need there was to, to alleviate the suffering of the people. So um, this uh, idea uh, is going to be played with within academia. So this is obviously the colleges and universities of America at the time who are taking some of this data and making these observations and writing about uh, you know, some of the shortcomings of the era in which they lived, which of course was the Gilded Age. And so there has been globally, at least within Western societies, uh, a debate between the the beauty of what we what is actually called liberal economics and the uh, conflicting or antithesis of of Marxism, and what we see starting in the Gilded Age is a sort of synthesis, if you will, of a new idea, socialism or uh, democratic socialism, however you want to phrase it. And academia is obviously a great uh, place for that to be articulated. And so um, uh, this, this becomes a big part of the movement. Now, we have to remember that when we think about uh, heavy government activism, we tend to think about the Democratic Party or the Green Party or things happening at the national level. But in, the, in point of fact, one of the big things about the progressive movement is the idea of emerging federal power when it comes to economic and social programs. And so we really see the progressive agenda experimented with first in the state governments. The, the two dominant were uh, Wisconsin with Governor uh, Robert La Follette and uh, in California with uh, uh, Governor Hiram Johnson. And so these state laboratories will be used to sort of test out ideas. Um, a young uh, governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, will certainly uh, get a lot of notoriety for what he had tried to do at the state level. Um, Christian crusaders were a big thing. This is, again, a, a, a relic of the, uh, the Second Great Awakening from the first part of the 19th century. After the Civil War, places, uh, of particularly Great Britain, in the United States, had started the idea of going out and uh, getting into the poorest areas of a, of a city and, in a sense, taking these people by the hand and cleaning up their lives and moving them forward and, and, and getting them to embrace things like temperance and, and hard work. And so the United States, during the Gilded Age, will import uh, the YMCA and the YWCA and the Salvation Army, which will be uh, groups to go into the inner cities and to uh, minority neighborhoods and, and try to, in a sense, convict individuals to get up, embrace God, and to embrace hard work and uh, to make a good life for themselves. Now, uh, Reformed Darwinism, we talked about a little bit in, in the previous chapter. So, 
Uh, Reformed Darwinism it was the idea that even though civilizations evolved, uh, past tense, into uh, various levels, if you will, of uh, civilization, it was possible for societies to get better, to improve, to quote-unquote progress. And this was going to be done through education and hard work and most specifically, government objective regulation and control. And so, uh, Reform Darwinism has a sort of uh, an emerging um, quote-unquote pseudoscience type of undercoating to it. Uh, now, again, another connection to the Second Great Awakening where women really took on large roles in reforming society as a consequence of the Second Great Awakening. Here again, we see females leading the, leading the path uh, for these reform movements. They are going to embrace things like child labor and improved working conditions for their husbands and sons and brothers and fathers. They are going to go out there and advocate, obviously, for more status and agency for women. And so uh, a lot of female activism is going to be necessary in order to get the progressive agenda move forward. Another class of, of uh, people are investigative journalists that Teddy Roosevelt will call muckrakers. Now, the muckraker is a character in the Pilgrim's Progress, and he believed that the world was just so awful and horrible that he thought as his duty to go out there and uncover it. And so he's raking through the muck to look for all that is evil. And Teddy Roosevelt believed that the journalists of the time period were much the same in that they failed to see the beauty that was out there. And they tended to not focus on anything in their subjects that might be um, uh, restorative or um, uh, good to say about someone, but instead always focused on the negative. And so, uh, uh, for instance, Ida Tarbell, who's known as the queen of the muckrakers, writes a scathing um, biography on John D. Rockefeller's uh, Standard Oil Company called The History of Standard Oil, which is just an absolutely scary, scathing caricature of, of John D. Rockefeller, which we still carry on uh, really to this day. And uh, she failed to tell either her publisher or her readers that her father had been driven out of business by John D. Rockefeller, which would certainly under, uh, underscore her desire for uh, ruining his reputation. So um, it was uh, another one, Jacob Rees, you know, uh, how the other half lives, which is a, a phrase in American lexicon still. Um, staged many of the photographs he used to show how horrible the living conditions were for the street urchins, the young children supposedly homeless, uh, in American cities. So the thing about it is muckraking journals such as McClure's Magazine, as you see here, were uh, very popular in the United States because they were doing this sort of cutting-edge uh, investigative journalism to go out there and expose the wrongdoings in American society and then to therefore advocate for reform and change. So feminism at the turn of the uh, 20th century was really focused on, on two different things. Uh, to the left you see uh, Jane Addams with her son and uh, reading. This was very much in women's advocacy for uh, children and education and for the end of all uh, child laborers. Uh, and then, of course, for suffrage, women still lacked the right to vote. Uh, women still had limited status under the law. And these were things that uh, uh, the female activists are going to focus on in order to um, try to make their lives better in America. So when we look at suffrage, it's actually quite interesting. So, uh, you know, if you had taken... Um, Early American history, you could probably remember this, but, you know, it's all of the early um, franchise for women came in the West. This is somewhat unusual. I think what most people would assume, particularly people from the East Coast would assume, that they had been the first to give women the right to vote. But in fact, it was Wyoming in 1869 that gave women the right to vote. And then, you, as you can see in the map, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, right? 
these these were states that had a very difficult time convincing women to either come to these places and certainly to stay. And these women were hardworking, many of whom did all of the same chores and work of their husbands. And it became sort of uh, uh, accepted knowledge that the men needed these women in order to make their their uh, their lives better. And so um, suffrage really came in the in the West first. And not until uh, 1920 does suffrage become universal for uh, for women. So, if we look at progressivism as an agenda, as you were, and some people call it the progressive agenda, um, it comes in various categories. So the first, of course, is democracy. How do we expand democracy? Now, this is always a difficult thing because America is not a democracy, right? So we are a republic which means that the people get to vote for representatives who go and uh, draft laws on their behalf. But the question had become in the Gilded Age, was it really a, a republic based on democratic principles or was it a republic based on party boss machinery? And so the obsession of the progressives was to find ways to get around this party boss system and, and the party machineries that tended to control, in particular, state legislatures and uh, city mayors. So um, in the state level, local and state level, were things called the referendum and initiative. This, these are forms of what we call direct democracy. So in the first referendum, the state legislature would draft a bill, they put it on the uh, ballot, and then the voters get to decide whether that bill becomes a law. In an initiative, the citizens themselves draft the bill. They get a certain number of uh, registered voters to sign a petition. That then uh, puts the, uh, the uh, item on the ballot for vote. And again, the people get to decide whether it becomes law. And again, these are both done to get around party bosses who it was believed controlled these legislatures. Similar to it is something called a recall. Now, as we well know, at the federal level, impeaching and getting rid of a federal official is a very daunting and um, stressful process. And it, no president has ever been expelled from office. This is one of the things people always kind of, I'm shocked when I'm in a, a cocktail party or something and an adult will say to me, well, Bill Clinton wasn't impeached. I was like, well, yes, he was. He was, he was impeached you know, by the House of Representatives. He was the, only the second president to be impeached. No, he wasn't. He finished his term. Impeachment does not mean expulsion. You could be in, impeached and still remain president, and that happened to two of them, Andrew Johnson and um, Bill Clinton. But uh, the recall is a way for the voters to remove an official that they deem incompetent or corrupt. This is an interesting twist, right? So uh, the people have to get a petition signed to put a recall on the ballot, and then the voters get to decide, A, should the current official be removed, and B, who should replace that individual. In California, that has happened uh, in recent history. Uh, Governor Gray Davis was recalled by the voters and replaced by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, in the city of San Diego, we had uh, Mayor Bob Filner, who was recalled by the voters and replaced by Kevin Faulkner, who uh, is currently the mayor of San Diego. So the direct vote of senators is an unusual one. Now, the, the only way to understand it is to go back to the Gilded Age. The party boss system had become so intricate and the party bosses so powerful that many party bosses of states became senators for those states. So um, it, what you have to do is you have to remember in the original constitution, the state legislatures appointed the senators for the U.S. Senate. And so party bosses would be so important to the victories of state legislators that if their party got the majority, it was their party bosses that were being sent to the Senate. So um, the Senate became seen as a room of fat cats who are just out to line their own pockets. And so this became a very big controversial thing. So a perception of the, um, uh, of the voters 
was that the the only way to deal with it was to uh, have the people vote for senators, not the legislatures. So we get the uh, 17th Amendment ratified in uh, 1913. And so now all of our senators are, are voted on directly. Uh, now, at the municipal level, there were various types of reform, all of, all of which were trying to get rid of the mayor's budgetary power. Uh, most cities in America allowed mayors to decide who got what contracts in order to provide services for the city. Well, this was a way for party bosses to graft, uh, to commit graft, uh, to sort of link their own po uh, personal fortunes to the spending of American cities. And so uh, the strong mayor system, which is a mayor is the chief executive and a city council is the legislature, gets challenged. And so there's a commission system, which is where you basically hire a panel of people to run the city collectively. Uh, many states in California run on a commission system. And then there was also something called the city manager system. And this is when the mayor is actually the chairman of the city council. And so it's, it's like a hyper legislature. And then the city council with the mayor at its head would hire a city manager. And uh, that individual would be responsible for actually spending the money and running and, and dealing with all the contracts and negotiating with bids and all this other stuff. And so um, uh, Galveston, Texas, I believe, was the first to, to tinker with these kinds of reforms. And... Uh, San Diego, California, where I live, is uh, was under the um, city manager system until the 1990s when the city managers were corrupt and incompetent and almost bankrupted the city. And the voters uh, got angry and decided to um, go back to the strong mayor system, which we, which we currently have. Now, women's suffrage, of course, is the 20, or excuse me, the 19th Amendment passed in 1920. Uh, this was the final straw in, in what I would call franchise amendments in the sense that uh, we now have what's referred to as universal suffrage. So uh, men and women, all races, uh, creeds and backgrounds will uh, be allowed to vote. The, the next major change in the voting procedure, of course, is the lower the age of voting from 21 uh, to 18, which... Um, comes in the 1970s with the 26th Amendment. Now, efficiency was this thing done by Frederick Taylor. And again, if you go back to uh, um, the Gilded Age, we talked about industrialization. Frederick Taylor believed he could go into a factory, find out how workers uh, do their specialized tasks, and come up with great numbers of efficiency about particularly what we refer to as piecemeal work, which is how many widgets can a person make per hour, per day, per week, and to make those sort of like uh, um, productivity standards for various jobs. And e even people at the time uh, found problems with Frederick Taylor's analysis and, and conclusions, and we could go on it all the time. But what's going to happen is progressives are going to latch onto this because they're going to believe that if you can make a skilled, an unskilled worker more efficient, they would demand a higher wage. And more importantly, government could be more efficient. And this is still an obsession, uh, particularly in um, progressive circles, that there is this possible way of creating um, more um, efficient government. So antitrust legislation. So here we go. Uh, whenever you see the word trust, you have to think t monopoly. So antitrust means anti-monopoly. There had been a law on the books called the um, Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, but it proved to have no teeth and, and very few courts actually went forward with prosecutions. And so uh, progressives believed that these loopholes had to be closed up and that the government, the, particularly the federal government, had to be more aggressive when dealing with um, uh, antitrust behavior, or I should say trust behavior in the United States. Social justice issues basically included uh, things like child labor laws, uh, women's status under the law, and uh, lynching. So lynching had been uh, since before the Gilded Age, but certainly after the Civil War, uh, lynching became the method of choice for whites in the South, particularly, to... Um, 
intimidate African Americans to remain in a sort of second class citizen status, um, and certainly to to uh, keep them from exercising their right to vote. Uh, led by people like Ida Wells, uh, there was an attempt by progressives to get the federal government to make lynching illegal. The problem was there had been a series of court decisions in the 1880s where the court basically said that the 14th Amendment only applied to governments. So uh, that meant that if the civil rights of blacks were being violated by white people in the South, uh, you had to prosecute them under criminal law, which meant that a Southern state had to arrest a white man and put him in trial before a white jury and find him guilty of assault murder or attempted murder and this just was not going to happen it did not happen and so um horrible violence broke out all over the south at one point um uh ulysses s grant uh threatened the state of north carolina that he was going to send troops back in there and reoccupy the state if they didn't stop the behavior so uh so there were a number of social justice issues that get on the table because of the progressive agenda and then prohibition now, this seems really weird to people because prohibition um, seems anti-progressive, right? People who are liberal or progressive tend to be more, let's just say, permissive or uh, um, lenient. And so the prohibition of alcohol seems very backward. But the fact of the matter is progressives and what you want to remember about progressives is that they believe that there were obstacles, obstacles to progress and that there were things keeping people from getting out of poverty. And drinking was one of those things, according to progressives. People who were poor, who were imbibing in alcohol, were risking their savings, risking their jobs, risking their families. And these were all things that the poor could not risk. So to progressives, the only solution was to remove the obstacle, and in this case, alcohol. So to the left is... Um, Francis Willard, who is the uh, founder of the Women Christians Temperance Union. And uh, to the right are um, uh, black workers in the South. And uh, in, you know, basically horrible conditions. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to break the progressive era into the three main presidents of the period. And this is uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson. And so um, we'll start with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So uh, Theodore Roosevelt is coming from what I believe to be a rather um, right of center position on the, on the deal. Roosevelt embraced what he called a square deal for America in which uh, the regulating of existing antitrust legislation would be upheld and more powerful enforcement powers would be established. Uh, Roosevelt would often support the regulation of trust over their dissolution, however, as he viewed this to be a more efficient way. He believed in what he called good trust. So, for instance, the United States Steel, uh, Carnegie's uh, company, when it went, when it went public. Uh, Roosevelt saw no problem with it being a monopoly because to Roosevelt, the economies of scale were important for making America a leading steel manufacturer and, and uh, for being able to supply the U.S. Navy with the best quality steel at the best possible price and to provide uh, what Roosevelt perceived to be good paying jobs for literally tens of thousands of workers. And so um, this became uh, a big uh, difference between Roosevelt and, say, uh, Woodrow Wilson. Teddy Roosevelt believed there were good trusts and bad trusts, and he believed in, in uh, corporate citizenship. And he believed that through his own executive actions, he could make things change. And so uh, Roosevelt does something that previous presidents and certainly no president in the Gilded Age would ever have thought to do, and that is to take charge, lead rather than follow, and to, in a sense, dare the legislature to uh, outdo him. And so uh, he goes out there uh, and he really makes a change for uh, uh, the American people. So his trust busting 
which, you know, they call him the trust buster, these famous cartoons of him, you know, holding a big, huge uh, stick and, and, and pummeling uh, the um, uh, securities commission, which was a, a group of people who had financed railroads under uh, J.P. Morgan. In fact, in this cartoon here, which is the first, uh, it's a cartoon of Teddy Roosevelt as the baby Hercules uh, and his first feat of defeating the Vipers. And the uh, gentleman on your left is J.P. Morgan and on your right is John D. Rockefeller. And if you, you'll notice the picture of John D. Rockefeller, if you look at that really closely, I challenge you, go and look up a uh, picture of uh, Monty Burns from... Um, from the Simpsons cartoon. And that is ig almost exactly the same thing. So Monty Burns is, in a sense, a, a caricature of John D. Rockefeller, the, the, the sort of quintessential miser and evildoer that is, you know, the sort of evil one percenter that's out there, you know, destroying the world, right? So when coal miners uh, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia went on strike, uh, they wanted a 20% pay increase and they wanted to go to an eight-hour workday. And uh, so what happened here is, is Roosevelt didn't follow the, the trend of the previous presidents, which was to send troops in and break up the strike in favor of the, of the owners. Roosevelt attempted to broker a resolution between the two sides by inviting them, inviting them both to the White House, and the owners refused to accommodate. They, they just became... Um, uh, bumps on a log and only in, when Roosevelt threatened to take over the mines did they take it seriously and, and the result was a 10% raise and a 10 hour work day and when, when uh, Roosevelt was uh, questioned about that by one of his staff he, he said well better half a loaf than no loaf at all and that sort of becomes uh, Roosevelt's uh, standard for progress as is, is it were politically so he becomes this sort of embodiment of something called positivism. And this is the idea that if you focus your attention, if you commit yourself to making things better, they'll get better. And, and, th that, and Roosevelt just was convinced about this almost his entire life. Uh, really, it's, it's only when he almost dies in an um, expedition in South America uh, that... Uh, and I, I'm not kidding. He literally could have died at, at any moment. It was is uh, he had to literally be carried out of the tropical forest uh, where he was um, slowly disappearing, losing so much weight. But until that moment, really, he was just always like, "Do you're committed? You get it? You do it? It'll happen." So the logical conclusion however is that if the president's power is expanding well so is federal power so roosevelt is establishing uh new norms of government behavior and here we get that uh progressive ideal that the federal government should be the objective third party to ensure that everybody plays by the rules and that everyone has the ability to progress. And this becomes a very overarching theme. And, and, and it's still there within progressive circles, right, in, in American politics. The idea that only the federal government has the capacity or the expertise or the objectivity uh, to step in and, and take care of problems, right, major problems confronting the American people. So now let's get into the darker side of it. And uh, the, the American Experience, which is a wonderful uh, series on uh, PBS, has done a documentary on um, eugenics. And this is something that um, very few Americans really understand. Um, Hitler got his ideas of eugenics from us. We experimented with these ideas on a local state and and even national level and uh there's um a famous supreme court case where a woman was suing her mother for having her sterilized um and the mother's excuse was well she's feeble-minded and um sexually promiscuous and um the supreme court favored the mother uh, 
you know, um, the great justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes said three generations of imbeciles is enough. Boom. Sterilizer. I mean, this is insane, right? So this was the, this is the belief that, um, one can improve society by eliminating negative genetic product from the gene pool, from the, um, population. And so, um, the poor, immigrants, minorities, especially African Americans, were to be encouraged to have abortions, were encouraged to be sterilized, and in some cases, sterilized without their consent, uh, in order to help society progress. I mean, this is, this is what people honestly believed. Roosevelt was a big defender of eugenics. He very much supported it. Um, and so uh, we get into uh, this darker side, if you will, of eugenics. And there's both positive and negative eugenics. So positive eugenics is simply to encourage the right people to breed. And negative eugenics is when you do things to either end a pregnancy or prevent pregnancies, right? And, and Hitler basically thought that this was great thinking and put it on an industrial scale and just started slaughtering millions of people. But the concept of purifying a gene pool uh, comes from progressives, uh, they called eugenics. So um, in the uh, second term of Roosevelt, so he, we always want to remember to be careful here, right? Roosevelt has two terms in office, but he was only elected once. So in 1901, he was the vice president of the United States, and William McKinley was shot and assassinated and killed uh, by an anarchist in Buffalo, New York. And so Roosevelt served all four years of McKinley's second term, and uh, then he gets reelected in 1904. Now, almost immediately, he starts yet another change in presidential politics, and that is to be the legislative leader. Uh, as we are finding out in recent history, right, presidents seem to um, take a great deal of pride and, uh, you know, a great deal of uh, gravitas in the State of the Union address, which is basically the president telling the American people and the legislature all the things that they believe should be the legislative priority of the coming year. Well, this is not constitutionally mandated. And it's, uh, there is a mandate in Article 2 that the president must give an annual message to the legislature on the State of the Union. And this has been done in writing up until Woodrow Wilson. But it's Teddy Roosevelt who becomes the first one to actually try to influence the agenda for the legislature. And uh, this is something that was very uh, different, right? And so um, he's going to get into this kick about getting authority to, uh, you know, make life better for Americans, right? And so um, the problem with him trying to change legislation, however, is that he um, had enemies even in his own party, right? The party bosses who were members of what was called the old guard, you know, conservative, ultra-conservative Republicans, really didn't like him. And so his legislative ideas would get stalled in the Congress pr process called pigeonholing. And in order to combat that, Roosevelt would go on speaking tours. He would go over the heads of the politicians and he would go right to the American people. He would get them excited about something. They would send letters and telegrams and lo and behold, these, these uh, bills would come up for votes. And it's referred to as the bully pulpit. Whenever, whenever Teddy Roosevelt saw something, heard something, read something that he thought was really amazing, he would open, he would yell, bully. And this is where we get the phrase, bully for you. Um, and so the bully pulpit was uh, something that Roosevelt implemented that's still done by all presidents today. And I don't care what political party, and I don't care whether you like the guy or don't like the guy, uh, they all engage in it. And, and uh, whenever you see them while they're president out there making speeches out in Podunk, West Jabib, Iowa, or wherever it is that they're, they're going, uh, that's trying to, uh, you know, engage in the bully pulpit. So now in 19, um, 
1906, excuse me, 1904, uh, there's a book published called The Jungle. And this is Upton Sinclair's book, which was meant to expose the horrible working conditions for um, uh, the meatpacking workers. And instead, the American people got exposure to what they thought was the most disgusting element of American society, which is the condition of America's food supply. And so Roosevelt himself calls for legislation to deal with the issue. And we get two major pieces, the Food and Drug Administration Act, which creates the FDA, the Pure Food and Drug Act, I should say, and then the Meat Inspection Act. And these uh, created national standards of what constituted uh, healthy and safe products for American consumption. And this is a big, big change in American, uh, which we still use today, right? The USDA grading system and the FDA system. Now, in con conservation and environmentalism, uh, we get a, a kind of a controversy here, and, and that is environmentalism really has two main strains, conservation and preservation. Conservation is the idea that you want to uh, uh, hold on to something, you want to nurture it and take care of it and restrict its use because you want to make sure that there's enough of it for future use. So you don't allow somebody to come in and cut down all the trees because then there's going to be no forest. So you manage the forest and you allow certain trees to be gleaned out and you're constantly resupplying the forest and that's conservation. Preservation is what our national park system is about. It's about taking something that's in a pristine state and leaving it that way for now and in all pos uh, posterity because we believe that it is such a national treasure to, to us. So <clears throat> really... It's Roosevelt's second term that we see the forming of what we would call a progressive movement. And so this causes strife within the Republican Party and within the Democratic Party. So it's, it's, it's not just one party that's, that's struggling here. And if you, <clears throat> I haven't noticed, right, the, the political philosophies of the two major parties are starting to switch. So the Republicans that started off in the 1850s as a federalist power party, excuse me, one that believed that the federal government should have more power, is starting to uh, move in the opposite direction the, with the so-called old guard, who are going to believe that it should be pro-business, anti-immigrant, and 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 um, it should have uh, weaker central government. This is happening in the Democratic Party in the opposite direction. The Democrats started off as a states' rights party, anti-federalist party and now are going to start through Woodrow Wilson to become more of a federalist philosophy, which is strong central government and expanding government power. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, Teddy Roosevelt's basically credited for beginning a, a quote-unquote progressive movement. So <clears throat> in 1908, uh, Roosevelt is, I'm going to say, politely... Um, pushed out. <laughs> he had given an offhanded remark in 1904 that he didn't have to serve a third term if the people didn't want him to. So in 1908, he was promptly reminded uh, by party bosses and others that he and, and the media that he had made this pledge. And, and so he, he has his hand-picked successor, Secretary of War, uh, William Howard Taft, uh, chosen as the nominee for the Republicans. And of course, with that, he, um, he wins, wins the election. Taft is an interesting uh, person, not just because of his size, <clears throat> uh, but because he never really wanted to be president. He was a big uh, legal scholar. He, he, he really enjoyed the law. He had gotten involved in Republican politics, and he was known throughout the party as being a great follower. Um, he obeyed his instructions to the letter when uh, McKinley made him the governor general of the Philippines and McKinley had made this statement about uh, kind of like a white man's ver burden for uh, America. Um, Taft took that totally to heart and he went to the Philippines and built schools and built water treatment plants and organized training things to uh, help teach uh, the Philippine elite how to be, you know, democratic leaders for their country and 
all these other things. And so um, he was friends with Roosevelt and Roosevelt made him secretary of war. And Roosevelt really loved him because whenever Roosevelt said, do this, uh, Taft not only did it, but he did it exactly the way Roosevelt asked him to do it and better. And so Roosevelt believed, in my opinion, that although he was going to leave office, Taft would be there to, in a sense, do his bidding for him. And if there was ever a problem, he'd just pick up the phone and tell Taft to do something, and he would do it. And this was not only unrealistic, but quasi-unconstitutional, really. But um, the, the biggest problem for Taft was, right after the inauguration, Roosevelt left the country. He went on a safari in Africa, and he was the front-page story, and everybody followed Roosevelt. And Taft was kind of left without any political base of his own. And so um, Roosevelt gave Taft the presidency, but then took the pomp of it with him to Africa. And Taft struggles to find a political base of his own. And he starts off, he, he busts more trust than Roosevelt does. And then he tries to actually reform the tariff system, which many people believe there was just all kinds of, corruption in it. And so Taft went about doing a tariff reform that ended up being so badly hacked by his own party that most of the tariffs actually went up instead of went down. But he signed it anyway uh, because he felt obligated to because it was his own party's bill. And uh, Roosevelt just thought that was ham-handed and you know just horrible and just sort of blabs it out just basically tells the media that that you know taft made a huge mistake but then there was a mix-up in the interior department and i don't really care whether people know who's who and all this other stuff but i believe it was ballinger who um basically ratted on an official for um in my opinion, probably taking bribes or other things in order to get favorable access to federal lands, uh, forests, for, for logging. And instead of confronting it within his department, he went over the head of his supervisors, plural, and appealed directly to Taft. And Taft had him fired for insubordination. To me, this makes sense because it's very Taft-like. Taft believed you obey your boss and you just, you go up the flagpole and you salute, every, you know, everything's exactly the way it should be. And th this guy didn't do that. And, and I could see Taft getting really mad. But um, in this respect, uh, he hired, this guy was a Roosevelt appointee and Roosevelt decided that that was it. And uh, he comes out publicly, calls the president a fathead, which, you know, for a guy that's 300 pounds, that's, um, you know, an obvious personal as well as political slam. And uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt decides to get back into politics. Now, initially, he runs for the Republican Party nomination. And back then, there were two different types of uh, ways of electing presidents. In the Republican Party, the nominee was going to be chosen at the national convention, but the states got to decide what how their delegates were chosen. And some states did it through a caucus system, which is with the party leaders in the state chose delegates. And some had been experimenting with a new progressive idea called the direct primary. And this is when the uh, registered members of the party in a state voted for who they wanted the nominee to be. And in all the states that used the direct primary, Roosevelt won handily over Taft. However, at the convention, the party bosses manipulated the votes to ensure that Taft, in fact, got nominated for a second term. Roosevelt and his followers said they smelled a rat. They walked out of the convention. They reconvened at a new convention and nominated Roosevelt for what's referred to as the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party and uh, called the Bull Moose Party because when Roosevelt was leaving the convention hall, a media man said, you know, uh, Mr. Pre President, Mr. President, you are now, you know, signif you're a little older now. Uh, do you feel like you're really up for getting back into politics? He said, well, nonsense. I'm as fit as a bull moose. And that's where they got their name. And here we get some traits of modern campaigning. Roosevelt comes out with what he called his new nationalism platform. 
And here you're going to see the truly, you know, modern idea, right? Instead of going on and on and on about various things, you, you keep it short. Three things, and they all start with the letter th C, right? The three C's. So corporate regulation, consumer protection, and con conservation. And with this, Roosevelt believed he could get everybody to, uh, you know, rally around his cause and go forward and, and make it work. Well, while the Democrats, or excuse me, while the Republicans were busy fighting amongst themselves, the Democrats were coalescing around a new and young and uh, uh, highly educated man from the South, right? And while he was the governor of New Jersey, he was actually born and raised in Virginia, the first Southerner to be elected president of the United States, elected president of the United States, um, uh, since Zachary Taylor in 1848, which is somewhat interesting. And he's also the only uh, president to hold a PhD. So um, his background was pretty straightforward, as I gave to you. Um, he had been president of Princeton and then governor of New Jersey prior to uh, taking, taking the White House. His democratic platform was referred to as the new freedom or the three T's, what he called the triple walls of privilege. And uh, tariffs, trusts, and taxes are what he called treasury. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, these these ideas now are on the table. Taft, on the other hand, is left really to hold on to the old guard support that he had been given uh, once Roosevelt uh, skedaddled from D.C. And uh, Taft was basically signed on to the party bosses who were obviously gravitating towards the, the old guard or um, uh, conservative politics. Um, he goes to um, a friend's house for dinner, and the friend's dog comes gets out of the kitchen and jumps into the president's lap and tries licking him and is jumping all over him, and the family's all freaking out because their dog is you know, messing around with the president of the United States, and they shoo him off and everything, and he goes, no, 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 leave it alone. It's the only thing that likes me. So... He was he was pretty ruined uh, by this election, but we, we don't want to feel sorry for the uh, President Taft. He becomes the only former president in American history to uh, be appointed to the Supreme Court, so uh, which was the job he had always wanted. So he uh, ends up uh, doing what he ever, always wanted to do. What we see with Wilson, however, is the acceleration of progressivism, where things really start to move quickly. The underward tariff lowered tariff rates for the first time in almost 70 years. Um, it's just significant lowering of the tariff. It also introduced the first income tax, and this came about from the 16th Amendment in 1913, which gave the federal government the power to tax income. That's right. I know what you're thinking. Why would the American people knowingly give the federal government the power to tax income? This is why, you know, be wary of direct democracies. Um, but anyway... Uh, progressives believed that there needed to be a tax on the wealthy. And uh, the um, progressives convinced the American people that they would never need to tax anybody but the top 5% of income earners and that there would probably never be an income tax rate higher than 4%. I'll let you do the math. So uh, then in 1914, we get the Federal Reserve Act, which was a way of reforming how uh, the U.S. currency and the um, uh, distribution of capital happens throughout the United States, and, and it was very irregular prior to that. And so um, a Federal Reserve system is what we still use today. The nation is divided into um, districts. Um, California, where I am, is in the 11th District uh, Bank, which is based in San Francisco. And so um, this was meant as a way to ease uh, capital flow. There had been a, what was called the dollar panic in 1907. And, uh, and this following the Great Panic of 1893, many people began to, or I should say, monetarists uh, or monetary specialists began to um, talk in academia about how there needed to be a more equitable, equitable and uh, tightly regulated circulation of cash, right, that the, the flow of capital needed to be regulated better, and the Federal Reserve was thought as a way of doing that. So antitrust laws became 
much tighter. In 1914, we have what's called the Clayton Antitrust Act, which creates um, uh, the rule that there's no monopolies. There's no such thing as a good monopoly or a bad monopoly. They're all bad, and they all have to be getting rid of. And this will uh, be regulated by a new agency called the Federal Trade Commission, which still operates today to regulate against monopolies. Uh, social justice issues, there are going to be child labor laws passed uh, under this. Uh, there is going to be um, uh, ad attempts to uh, improve um, uh, sanitation and, and other things, uh, working men's compensation for people who are injured on the job. So uh, again, a very, very rapid and aggressive progressive agenda that's going on here. And there is, again, if you will, the bad side to this there the progressivism was not something that was geared specifically towards uh, African Americans Indians or um, Hispanics and and for most of the progressive era certainly not for women so this was seen as um, you know if you you know the sort of evil side of all of this now Wilson was I think fairly um, what we would today consider to be a racist. He, he was uh, not a fan of African Americans. He was not particularly kind to them. Um, he was known to be very curt and, and rude to uh, the wait staff. Um, and the, the people who ran the White House, who actually made the White House work, were almost exclusively African American. And in Washington, D.C., they made up the center of a very elite uh, middle class of African Americans in the city who took great pride at the, at the work that they were doing in the nation's capital. And um, when they didn't show due deference to Wilson, he was rather cold. And he did have a private showing of D.W. Griffith's um, uh, Birth of a Nation, which is sort of a glor glorification. Um of the South in, in the Civil War and, and the aftermath of the Civil War. He did, however, denounce the Ku Klux Klan um, for its reign of terror on people, um, even though he sympathized with their ideas as far as um, uh, racial superiority. Now, for women, the women's movement is going to... Uh, this is Alice Paul. Um and, you know, so the 19th Amendment passes in 1920, which gives women the right to vote. And almost Im immediately we, we get to see divisions within the that electorate. Um, the, the Women's Party will form in 1923. Its main um, platform item is going to be the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, which will be passed a couple of times, uh, to my knowledge, once when I was a young person. In the 1970s, the ERA will pass again, and it fails to get ratified. And um, the Women's Party really starts to uh, demonstrate the, the idea that you know women don't vote in blocks. It's one of the things that I still find amazing is this idea that if you're a female, that somehow you're supposed to vote a certain way. And what we see repeatedly throughout um, women's voting history since the 1920s is that women women don't always vote in straight blocks. They they really do have divergent opinions um, based on other things rather than their gender. And so uh, Margaret Sanger, of course, and birth control. Um, she is part of this uh, kind of uh, uh, right. She she embraces now. Let's just sort of lay this out here, right? And this, again, you can get this in the uh, PBS documentary on, on eugenics. She first addressed things like the lack of childcare and the fact that working women, working poor, the working poor, women had to work. They, 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 there just wasn't a choice, right? And so, um, and then legal issues. In, in custody battles, women did not have equal status as the men. Uh, men were still perceived to be in possession of the children that they were actually his property and that women uh, had limited rights in that respect and and Margaret Sanger along with others uh, fought to change essentially state laws uh, to ensure that women got uh, more equal status in these types of issues 
But then Margaret Sanger also embraced eugenics. She was a very, very big supporter of eugenics, and she is the founder of Planned Parenthood. And this uh, this ideology was based in part on the idea that you could, in a sense, prevent certain groups from breeding and that this was going to allow for uh, less poverty and everything. And again, we get into, you know, this, the broader issues, what goes on, right? So, you know, progressivism obviously comes to an end in 1920s. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we have to understand about progressivism for all of its warm and fuzzy is that there's a lot of paradox and irony here. Uh, they say they're out to help the poor, but then they kind of condescend to the poor. You know, it's it's kind of like, um, uh, you know, patronizing to say to somebody, oh, let me come and help you when we're talking about a fully grown, perfectly functioning adult. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, nativism in the progressive agenda. You know, a lot of the people who are being targeted for abortions and birth control and sterilization, the ones that are being, you know, f forced to not drink and all these other things are immigrants and minorities. And, you know, you have to be careful here, right? You know, it's, is, is this really, you know, progressive, quote unquote, when it's, you know, the, so much of the focus is on the poor and the minorities and immigrant populations. But we also have to acknowledge that progressivism follows on the same pendulum sp swings of all politics, right? Uh, the, the Gilded Age was a relatively conservative type of uh, socio-political environment, and then it swung into the more uh, liberal and progressive way, and now in the 20s, we see it swinging uh, back again. So um, now, the other thing that we notice is that when we go from Teddy Roosevelt to Wilson, we see this path from being a right of center operation to being a very left of center operation under Wilson. And it's an interesting progression. And so what happens then is uh, Teddy Roosevelt basically does a mea culpa, goes back to the Republican Party, but his running mate, Robert La Follette of, uh, of Wisconsin, stays with the Progressive Party and runs uh, a at least two more times to my knowledge for the presidency and the progressive party will reemerge in 1948 and so uh it, it you know the progressives are going to start to leave you know with roosevelt they left the republican party and when roosevelt goes back most of the progressives did not go back with him they either stayed in the progressive party or they're going to move and become wilsonians which is, you know, a, a very important shift in the political alignment. And so um, <clears throat> many historians, myself included, believe that it was really World War I is the final death knell of the progressive ideal. Um, embedded in progressivism is the notion that humanity will improve, that through hard work and dedication, humanity will be improved and there'll be a new dawn of great things, nothing destroys that idea better than the death and destruction of 20 million people in the most horrible and terrible ways possible uh, at the hands of our own foolishness. So um, uh, this comes to the conclusion of our 20-year period that we refer to as the Progressive Era. Uh, I'm Don D'Angelo. Thank you very much.